Irene and Andrew, welcome back to this second episode, um, talking about the work of Future Care Capital and the future of social care in particular. Um, we talked in the last episode a lot about uh, local issues and opportunities, and we're now going to move on to uh, some of the thinking around the national perspective. And when we think about the uh, maybe the gap between policymakers and practitioners on the ground in relation to things we've been talking about, if I can just sort of um, take us uh, back to the sort of national level, national thinking and government action around this crisis. Do you think that the government's actions or inaction on social care during this crisis will come back to haunt them? <laughs> um, I, <clears throat> I think the first thing I'd say is I, I would not like to be in government at the moment. Uh, and and I, I don't think that there is any individual who's played any part in this who has not tried to do the best thing that they possibly can. And often in the face of um, a, a lack of data, a lack of information, um, and, and having to make some really quick and tough decisions with, with multiple competing parts. And it's very easy for us to look at this from from through through one lens, but actually it, it's all part of a, a much bigger jigsaw. Um, but on the other hand, that is why these people go into these jobs as, as politicians, and that, and that is what we elect them to do, is to make those, those difficult decisions for us. So in hindsight, it is very easy to criticise what, what, what has happened and, and talk about what should have happened. Um, I think that my concern um, for the sector that's more on the social care side of things is that social care will, will, will end up being the scapegoat. Um, as we talked about, the, 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 the reaction has necessarily been towards the acute because it has been an immediate lockdown to protect people. It has been about um, making sure there's capacity in the NHS. But, but what that's meant is that... Um, care homes, social care has not had the same access to PPE that, that the NHS has had um, or as quickly. Um, people have struggled to, to buy from their own supplies because that supply has been, has been diverted. Um, it, it also means that, that, that care homes have, um, have not had the same level of, of guidance or there's been guidance that has been issued from Public Health England and I think there's last count more than 20 different levels of guidance and it is it's hard to disseminate to multiple uh, to tens of thousands of individual organizations um oft, often who only who are sort of owner managed uh, and have 20 beds in a care home or, or what have you so they don't have the same same resource to understand guidance that change on a daily basis and there's then guidance that issued by the local authorities which is which is based on the Public Health England guidance, but may be interpreted differently. Guidance that's issued by the regulator, which again is based on the same central guidance, but interpreted differently. Uh, and often these guidances are, are competing with each other. <laughs> um, and actually there isn't the resource uh, for, for people to look after it. So my, my concern is that the sector will then become, uh, become the scapegoat because, uh, because they, haven't, um, they haven't been able to to provide the, the care that, that they're trying to. Um, yeah, I think that's, um, yeah, that's where I think we, we may end up. Yeah, can I, can I just comment, if I, if I may, in terms of the political um, response and management of this crisis. Um, I, I, as Andrew said, I, I wouldn't want to be in there doing this at the minute because the truth of the matter is you're damned if you do and you're damned if you don't what you know when when a country a nation is affected like this there's always an opportunity to criticize isn't there um which again comes back to the lessons learned however one of the things that is very stark for me working in this sector is from day one we started off with save our nhs and then we moved to save lives and save our NHS. Uh, and that all started early March. Um, so I think it was around about the 12th of March. It wasn't until the 15th of April, a month later, that the care sector, the social care sector was mentioned. And even now, although I look at, I watch every night 
I don't watch the whole thing because a lot of t- a lot of it is repetitive. Even though I watch every night, and if I'm out, I listen to it on my phone. We've had the ministers roll out for transport, for police, um, for um, uh, I'm just trying to think of who else we've had. We've had so many different ministers rolled out at the briefing. Not once have we seen the social care minister. So for me, there is a subliminal message there, rightly or wrongly, that says they're not as important. And so I, you know, so, and because they're, they're, it's overt in its absence, you know, it, it's, it's, for me, it's been a very strong message that every minister you can think of that, you know, that are in cabinet have been fronted. Not and I wonder if, if we go back to something you said earlier, you know, you, you were talking about this is in the, the too hard box. And, it, and let's say for the sake of argument, this is, is just too hard. And that is why ministers haven't gripped this in the way that they could, um, in my view, in, in, you know, previous years and through this crisis. But doesn't that play to the argument, perhaps, that we've read about and heard about around maybe a national care service mm. and the nationalisation of care. Uh, now <laughs> you obviously have experience working outside of the public sector, both of you I do too, um, but what, what are your views on that? Because I suppose one could say well look, we're talking about the NHS being this iconic organisation or federation of organisations uh, and that the focus was all on the NHS. Surely if we had a national care service then that would that shift would naturally happen. Um, it depends on what we mean by national care service, because mm-hmm. it, you couldn't have a national care service apropos of the NHS because it's not affordable. It, it would never be affordable. Um, so, um, it, from from the point of view of let's get some national standards and have a national standards agency or something similar. Totally, there is opportunity in my view to do that. Coming back to what's the data we're counting? What are the standards we expect? And okay, CQC do a, an okay job in respect of auditing standards, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, but that's not enough. What are the education standards that we put into our care homes? Because you know the number of times it makes me feel ill actually when I, I think about it that people refer to low pay, low paid unskilled workers. They are not unskilled workers. And they're not all low paid. Some of them, yes, they, you know, I'm not going to argue with that. They are not unskilled workers. They have to have training the same as everybody else. But there is no standardized, nationally agreed, this is the expectation and this is what people must be trained to this particular level. Every nurse, every doctor, every physio, every OT, every health professional has to be trained to a certain level. Not in the care home sector, other than they are required in a nursing home to have nurses who we know are regulated. Um, So I think there is real opportunity to explore what nationalisation might look like, but I think calling it a national care service gives the wrong impression that this it will be a funded service because it will never be funded it can't be it's just not not possible okay. although maybe I'll something proves me wrong maybe yeah. something <laughs> wrong that would be wonderful thanks irene andrew well I, I i agree with irene it all depends what we mean by nationalizing and what we mean by national care service in, in my mind what we should talk about as a national care service is a holistic fully integrated service that doesn't just include acute parts of healthcare. So the NHS, you know, to be clear, the NHS isn't the NHS. It is a series of commissioners um, and a commissioner of care. The provision that the NHS provides is fairly limited. Um, it is it is hospital trusts and, and, and ambulance trusts and, and various other trusts, but but the provision is, is limited and it's a, and it's acute. Uh, and each of those trusts, in effect, is, a, is its own entity and, oper- and operates as its own individual organisation. 
but the majority of uh, of healthcare within the NHS is provided by independent providers. Now, whether that's a GP uh, working as a, yeah. in a practice or a, or a corporate or a pharmacist or an optician or a dentist or a physio, th th these are independent providers contracted and commissioned by the NHS. They are not NHS workers, <laughs> um, as 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 we the public think that anyone who works in in health is. Um, and then you have, as I say, this this separate social care system, which which works in a which works in a similar manner. It is uh, it is it is commissioned locally by uh, by a combination of local authorities, CCGs, and individuals paying for paying for things privately, um, and it is predominantly provided by the independent sector. Now, whether again that's corporations, individual partnerships, uh, or charities, um, in this in the same way as, as, as GPs do it, uh, it they they are. They, they are contracted or commissioned by the local authorities uh, or people pay privately for it. And but if you have a national care service, you should talk about the care and well-being holistically, which is which is acute and it is prevention and, and long term. And we haven't really talked about prevention. Um, and, and when we talk about data, that's that I think is a really important thing. It's part of the reason things are in the too hard box, in my view, is because it is easy to talk about how much money you are going to put into the NHS. And if I'm going to put 20 billion in, I'm better than somebody who's going to put 15 billion in. And that's easy to quantify. But to do what um, is the question and with, and with what outcome? It is it is also easy to talk about the number of deaths that have been uh, in care homes uh, that you can attribute to, to COVID-19 because they're registered. What no one's talking about are the number of people who've had suspected symptoms, who've never been tested and who've got better, which is a significantly larger number than people who have died and have COVID-19 on their death certificate as suspected because they've never been tested. And equally, the number of people who've been tested and um, and and uh, and recovered as well. It, it's not talked about. I think it doesn't fit the narrative, but it but it but it's not talked about. It is also very it's far more challenging to to gather the data of people who were well and therefore never visited a hospital, and they were well because of their lifestyle choices, because of the prevention methods that that they were put in. And so, until the conversation shifts and the focus shifts to what's visible and acute people on trolleys in a um, in a in an accident emergency department to to those things that are less visible and more about prevention i think it's going to be difficult to make any changes but the national care service should absolutely be uh, be holistic and it should not be about nationalizing care because um, nationalizing care or nationalizing provision um, I'll give you an example of a, a local authority that pays 25% more to commission the services that they provide than they pay to commission the services of the independent sector. And so you say, well, how is that? How is that fair? Well, obviously it isn't fair. Why should the independent sector get paid less to provide the same service? But the answer is because well, the rationale for doing it is because they cannot provide it at the price they provide it to the independent sector. And the truth is the independent sector can't provide it because it's not not enough, um, but they subsidize it because because they have far more private pay who they then charge more. So how is it fair that you or I, if we're paying for it ourselves, end up paying more for the same service that, that a local it's, authority does it? It's so complex, isn't it? And it's interesting how whenever we have this conversation and not just within our organization, elsewhere as well, it, it always seems to default to money. Um, mm -hmm. And I mean, Irene, you mentioned affordability, first of all, and, and Andrew, you've continued with that theme. Some of the work we've been doing uh, in this organisation um, related to our uh, Care Labs programme has been examining the way that communities uh, can come together and look at how the future of care is sort of co-created in that holistic fashion. Um, now, for me, that's not a woolly concept. And I think that's been played out by COVID-19 when you see the the number of mutual aid groups and, and many of those have been doing some fantastic work and individuals, neighbours, friends, family doing amazing things to care for people, to help them, whether it's 
going and collecting their prescriptions or, or whatever it might be. Um, I just wondered in terms of what we're doing with Care Labs and your view more broadly around community co-creation in the context of uh, uh, calls for a national service perhaps um, and affordability issues and all the other things we've been talking about. Um, where do you think the opportunities are in communities going forward in the future for this, this new approach? So, uh, <laughs> I was going to say, I mean, uh, for me, the important thing is bringing all the right people together. Um, and, uh, and and those are the people who are receiving care, the families, the people who provide the care, the commissioners of care, the regulators of care, uh, they're ordinary members of the public. Um, they are the investors in care, the, the, um, the people who are, who are developing services and have got the money and are interested in doing it. Because... All too often, a lot of these people are, are missed out of the conversation and they're not brought round the table or bits of them are. So you have so you, so you might have just the, the public sector individuals come together to talk about integration and they bring together the CCG and the local authority. But they've ignored all the providers and they've ignored the regulators and they've ignored the investors. Um, uh, or, or you have investor conferences which have the private providers and you have the investors and, and maybe you have a government minister come and talk but the commissioners and the regulators are, tend not to go to these events uh, and, and it's actually vital that, and particularly in the community because the, com because the provision of care is incredibly local so I mean there are questions as to whether it, uh, the guidance from above uh, and centrally should apply to everybody at all times because because it is very local. The demand is very local uh, and it's very specific on on the on the type of population and the density of population and, and all sorts of other variables. So it needs to be done at a very local a local level because a lot of it is 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 about behaviour and, and culture and that I think is bringing all the parties together to be part of it rather than just the, the sort of usual suspects who, who sit in their own silos and, and are part of it, but within their own silos. Uh, if I may, Greg, I think you raise a, a really, really good question um, in terms of sort of uh, locality, social care and groups, etc. And again, I think this opportunity now to create something out of the adversity that we've all experienced with, um, with COVID-19, um, it would be a really interesting exercise because first and foremost, I'm thinking, you know, the number of people that will have, have created networks, there's one in my own area that's, you know, on an app, neighborhood network, um, who wants any shopping, who wants this, I need my hedge cutting and, uh, you know, so on and so forth. For, the, for that sort of thing to happen gives a real opportunity, along with implementation of technology and people who are isolated, and I don't mean isolated for a COVID-19 point of view, isolated because of age-related diseases or whatever, if they have the right technology, could be doing what you and I are doing now, almost on a daily basis with somebody who doesn't have to turn up at the house. You've also got the issue of, you know, people turning up at the house and maybe doing the shopping. Now, if you were to do that pre-COVID-19, I think you would do it because it's a personal arrangement with that individual. But if you did it through an organisation, you'd have to have a DBS check. You'd have to go through all sorts of scrutiny. And these are people generally, OK, there's always somebody that's, you know, not well intended out there in the world, but... Generally, these are all people who have real intentions to do good, but it delays everything and the bureaucracy behind it that's been put in place could create you know, challenges for, for the future. However, using the technology as we have now, and certainly, you know, I, I, I've seen it in the care home sector, the use of iPads for conversations with families, you know, whole things going on through the technology it's it's fantastic and um, that wouldn't have happened six months ago it might have done but occasionally not regularly i i think i just just to build on irene's point i think there's um some really interesting points around the 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 attitude towards towards risk and and where it sits um and 
in times of the crisis like like COVID, there isn't the same risk averseness that, that there perhaps is at, at other times. And I think Irene is absolutely right. So much of of the way we behave in the sector or behave as practitioners or behave as uh, regulators or um, uh, or investors or, or or whoever it is, it is about managing the risk and covering the risk. So from a DBS perspective, for example, as Irene said, the majority of people go into this sector because they want to help and they want to do good. There are very few who 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 go into it to cause harm. And yet the regulations are put in place to try and weed out those few. But the underlying or the implicit assumption is that everybody is doing that unless you have those regulations in place. And, and actually you see that in the attitude of the people who work there is I must stop this because otherwise everybody will be abusing people in their care homes unless unless they do, which of course is, is nonsense and not true. And the bizarre thing is that that actually those people who were intent on doing it would get through anyway. The Harold Shipman's of the world would, 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 would be able to buy as they did for you. So actually we, we need to be a bit more we need to be a bit more um, we need to be, have a bit more of a measured approach to to managing managing the risks um, and the focus should not be on how do I manage this risk but how do I provide the best possible care in all circumstances um, and, uh, and therefore the risk should be managed uh, or therefore I have a I have a reason at, at the moment one of the one of the things that the, the care sector is getting worried about is um, is that PPP, PPE will become the new PPI and there are law firms who are setting up who yeah. are who are building themselves up to say has your loved one died or been mistreated because care home carer hasn't had hasn't had PPE and so it's back into that blame well, well whose fault is it o on the news last night where I live on the local news as a care home that they that's being investigated by the police because they've had a number of, of COVID deaths. The police are involved. And the discussion is, well, is it the hospital trust fault? Is it the local authorities' fault? Is it the care provider's fault? Is it the guy? And that's and that was what the discussion is. Well, well, what, who do we pass the blame to rather than how do we look after the people in our care homes? And, it, and if you're employing your staff to document everything so that you cannot be sued or you have you can show you know, the, the sort of adage of look I tick the box on the on the full register to show that they fell over um, rather than help the person up off the floor <laughs> mm. it's that sort of thing that we need to we need to be focusing on so um I'm going to bring this together to, to a conclusion it's been a really interesting discussion um and I, I wanted to I suppose finish off just referring to civil society organisations and civil society generally, because um, I mean, civil society covers charities like ours, voluntary sector organisations, social enterprise, um, but also, of course, as we've mentioned, communities, individuals, mutual aid groups. And I think there's a real role for civil society, isn't there, in, in the future of social care. And this crisis has shown the importance of civil society and maybe even the extent to which uh, government values aspects of the uh, you know the work that civil society does, but what are your key takeaways on this? I, I, I just prompt an answer, I suppose, by saying that for me, organisations like ours need to be able to and proactively hold up a mirror to those who are making decisions and uh, setting out policy, and yeah, challenge uh, the way of thinking around how we can best do things from a policy perspective, but equally. Uh, work with others, individuals, partners, in terms of practical things that can be done on the ground to improve the way that care is delivered. From your perspective, to, to pull this together, what's your view around civil society in this context? Do you want to go first, Andrew? I was hoping you might go first. Okay, no, I'm, happy, I'm, ha I'm happy to go first because I think, um, Greg, you know, your analogy of holding up the mirror it is, is absolutely right and I for, for me all of this now is I, I would say whatever we do in civil society or whatever happens from here on in please not let's not make it bigger than it needs to be 
please let's make decisions about how we can work to better use the experiencing and the learning we've had. Let's not create bureaucracies, which is what we do so well in health and social care. You know, so let's be really critical of how we've we've behaved previously, get rid of some of that and recognise that civil society actually has a very strong, a very strong position in how we develop both health and social care for the future. So, but, and, and I would always say, please can I be involved? <laughs> Thanks, yeah, I, I I agree. I think it's I think the important thing is is not to go back to pre-COVID and and say we want to go back to normal, but it is to 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 try and take forward what what has worked well in COVID. You know, as Irene said, people supporting each other on a, a that that's that's human nature. That's what that's what people do. Um, and not bureaucratizing that, as yeah. Irene says, to not to to say, well, we need to make sure well, you can't do that until this or, or, or whatever it whatever it might be, um, but to allow it and to in, encourage it to happen. Uh, I think you know one of the things that surprised me. I did a piece of work last year where I looked at uh, the social care sector, is that the demand for social care. Uh, elderly care in particular is 130 billion pounds per year and that is based on the number of people who are receiving care but also the number of people who are who are receiving informal care by a relative or a neighbor or, or a friend um, and uh, which is the the vast majority of that somewhere between 60 and 90 billion depending on based based on what it would cost um, a local authority which is Below the cost of what it really costs, but a local authority to provide that care. 130 billion is what it is. And in the, in, in, now that's more than the NHS budget. I was just going to say that. <laughs> um, and, and, and therefore, uh, and, and it is wholly unrecognised, um, and it is done informally by people who, um, who perhaps don't even consider themselves to be carers. They are, after all, just looking after their mum. Um, but often, the, uh, and, and by the way, that number doesn't also doesn't include the opportunity cost of that, the fact that somebody has had to give up work to, to care for a, a relative or, or what have you. Um, but that is, that is how society is. Uh, and, and the more that those people um, are, are, are recognised uh, and, and are allowed to support and are, and are brought into the community, and not just allowed to support, Given the tools to help them support that now, whether that's whether that's specific training on you know about training on helping somebody uh, understanding dementia, and looking after a relative with dementia, knowing when to use the right bits of the system and how to access it. Where, where, on the healthcare side, when do we need to go to a GP? When do we need to go to A and E? When do we? Uh, and those, I think, is you talk about the, the, the care labs actually bring the community together and and having those kind of education pieces. I think is hugely important to that, so everyone can get the most out of it, but also get the most out of their lives and and um, and, and live and prevent and support support communities and the NHS um, and the country in that way. Great. Thank you both. Well, um, I'm going to end on uh, the most positive note I can, which is that although I think there is a real risk that things stay as they are or could even get worse, I think there's a bigger opportunity for things to get better if, as we discussed, we, we learn from this current crisis and, and where we can where we can take things. Um, thank you both very much for joining me for this. It's been a fascinating conversation. This is part of a series of conversations that I'm having with leaders and others from across the sector and beyond. So thank you both uh, very much indeed.